Behind me you can see Hamburg, a city in the north of Germany, and today we would like to take you through a journey of Jewish life. Starting with the first Sephardic Jews coming to Hamburg in the 16th century fleeing from Inquisition, to the Jewish emigration into the world, but also into the dark times of the Second World War, and to the Jewish life today. The Jewish cemetery of Hamburg-Altona at Königstraße is the oldest cemetery in Hamburg nowadays, and it is also the oldest document of Jewish life in Hamburg. If you take a closer look at the cemetery, you'll see that it is divided into two different parts. The slightly older part is the Sephardic one, founded in 1611 by Portuguese and Spanish Jews. The first Sephardic uh, families arrived, fleeing the Inquisition, and they tried to settle down in Hamburg and they were actually allowed to do so because those people who arrived here, uh, they were merchants, some were doctors, they were actually quite wealthy and they already had connections to the so-called New World like South America um, and what, is, what Hamburg is famous for now, the trading with chocolate, with sugar, with coffee, it's actually something the Sephardis established. Already by the late 16th century, the first Ashkenazis are settling down in this region. They were mostly poor people who did not speak German, but Yiddish, um, and they didn't have much to offer the trading city of Hamburg. So officially, they were not allowed to live in Hamburg. Uh, they had to settle down here in Altona. Uh, the city of Altona was an independent city of its own when the cemetery was founded. It was under Danish rule and the King of Denmark had declared freedom of religion, so it was quite easy or relatively easy for Jewish people to settle down in Denmark. It is only up until 1710 that there is a law passed that also the Ashkenazis are officially allowed to live in Hamburg. Freedom of religion is something we have in Hamburg in 1860 with a new constitution, and then the Jews are also equal, at least by law. The Hamburg Temple was the first permanent reform synagogue built in Hamburg during the 19th century and the first ever to have a reform prayer rite. It was also during the 19th century that the Bornplatz Synagogue was erected, a structure that defied all Jewish architectural canons and which would be completely destroyed during the night of the broken glass. Fifty years after the destruction, the former location was redesigned and since then a floor mosaic has been reminiscent of the synagogue. Already in April 1933, just a few months after Nazis coming to power, Jewish life in Germany and in Hamburg as well has changed in many ways. There were first boycotts of Jewish businesses, there was first legislation which would constrain Jewish rights and the culmination of the persecution would happen in 1938, 9th of November, which is actually today. And that's what we refer to in English as the night of the broken glass, where countless businesses would be set on fire, synagogues, schools, anything Jewish would be set on fire. And many people have lost their lives in this mass organized pogrom by the Nazi authorities. We are now at a place which used to be Hanoversche Bahnhof, Hanover rail station, one of the many rail stations within Hamburg serving different directions. What it became famous though was the role it played during the Holocaust because in the 1940s over 8,000 Hamburg Jews but also Hamburg Roma and Sinti people and many other ethnic minorities living in Hamburg were sent from here from this very railroad tracks to death. In addition to the concentration camps, 
where Hamburg Jews would end up after deportations. There were also concentration camps within Hamburg. One of them would be the Sauer Ufer, which was located in the southern harbor area of Hamburg, which was a filial camp of Neuen Gamme. So, my name is Lucy Debus. I am a free member of the KZ Gedenkstätte Neuen Gamme. Dort arbeite ich mit Besucherinnengruppen, viel mit Jugendlichen und mache dort pädagogische Programme, Rundgänge und Projekte. Unsere Initiative erstmal hat sich 2017 gegründet ähm, und wir haben dann angefangen erstmal zu dem historischen Ort zu forschen. Das Lager aus G ist ein Gebäude, was es schon seit, das wurde schon Anfang des 20. Jahrhunderts ähm, gebaut und dann eben ab ähm, Juli 1944 als Außenlagerskz in Gamma benutzt. Das heißt, ähm, dort wurden zunächst ähm, 1500 Frauen, die als Jüdinnen verfolgt worden waren, ähm, von der SS hin verschleppt. Später im September wurden diese Frauen dann in andere neu entstandene Außenlager ähm, verlegt und da, ab da wurde das Lager dann eben als Männerausenlager genutzt. Hamburg Jewish Community was reestablished still in 1945, few months after the war was over, with only 72 members mostly Holocaust survivors. However, already a few decades later, the community would number around about 1,300 people. Many of them would come to Hamburg from elsewhere. In 1916, the new synagogue in Hamburg was erected, which is still the main synagogue in Hamburg today. And much like elsewhere in Germany, in Hamburg, the community has grown rapidly ever since 1991. I came to Hamburg to establish the Chabad Lubavitch Center. And about 10 years ago, I was elected to be a chief rabbi of the city Hamburg and rabbi of the community in Hamburg. When my wife and I came here 18 years ago, so we found um, a nice synagogue, was active on Shabbat and Jewish holidays. There was a kindergarten and there was an active cemetery. Um, we decided to add a lot to Jewish life, to add new projects, new institutes. And today we are very proud that the Jewish community in Hamburg um, have much more to offer. So a lot of people say, why that the Jewish, the young generation should be interested in old tradition? So first of all, we have to connect them with the tradition. We have to tell them, how interesting, how nice, how rich is our tradition. And if they cannot or they don't want everything, they at least should take a part of it and see themselves as a, a part of the chain of the generations. From the other side, we live in a generation where people going through many things that maybe in the past took 60, 70 years to do. Today we have young people that they are 30 they saw everything, they try everything. They have young people, they are rich, they have everything they did, or not necessarily rich, but they, they saw the world, and they coming to the point and said, okay, what's next? And then they start to think, something missing in my life, and I want to find what's missing in my life. And this is the way, this is the point where we're coming in, to say, yeah, you're missing in your life some meaning, and look what we have to offer, in our religion. We have Torah, we have so many, we have Talmud, we have so many books, we have really interesting tradition. So if, you look, if you're looking for something to fulfill your life, here we have what to offer you. So we are now on the banks of the Elster, of the inner Elster Lake, and right on the street called Jungfernstieg, which historically was the center of Hamburg commercial, of Hamburg economic, and also of Hamburg social life. Today I want to tell you a few of the stories of the Jewish businessmen who changed Hamburg and also in different ways changed the world. And the first person I want to tell you about is the man behind a famous brand called Nivea. And the man who was the founder of Nivea was a German-Jewish businessman called Oskar Troplowitz. 
Now, Oskar Troplowitz was one of the founding fathers of the modern cosmetic industry. He obviously invented the famous Nivea cream, but also many other products, including, shall I say, the modern day form of toothpaste and band aid. Another story which I want to tell you is about a man called Heine. He was back in his days the richest man who ever lived in Hamburg, who was a man behind many businesses, his bank which he was operating, but also behind many charitable actions. It's 1842, we are talking about one-fourth of the whole city being destroyed completely. Heine was the man who would give out his personal funds to rebuild the city, to make it a livable, a better place once again. Here, right behind my back, it's a monumental building with a sign saying Hapa Gloid, which is the major shipping company in the world today. Originally, it was just Hapag, which was also known as Hamburg America Line. And Hamburg America Line was run by one of the most visionary businessmen in Hamburg history, called Albert Ballen. Now, Albert Ballen is famous for many things, one of them being the inventor of the modern cruise ship. The very idea of traveling the world on a luxury ship, not for the sake of getting somewhere, but for the sake of enjoying the journey and having a vacation. I want to talk about another part of Balin's story which changed the world, and that's a place called Balinstadt. That's the immigrant town, so to say. That was a place where we could say people were perfectly equal. Jews, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, all people from all over the Europe would come there in the equal conditions and pretty much for the same purpose. Now a museum of immigration. Ja, wir befassen uns hier in erster Linie mit der Zeit zwischen 1860 bis 1914. Ein ganz wesentlicher Teil jüdischer Migrationsgeschichte aus Osteuropa über den Hamburger Hafen in die neue Welt, also nach Amerika, vornehmlich nach Nordamerika. Die jüdische Migrationsgeschichte ist natürlich auch für Hamburg sehr, sehr wichtig gewesen. Es waren viele Menschen, die eben aus Osteuropa und aus Deutschland dann über den Hamburger Hafen in die neue Welt gegangen sind. Aber natürlich auch noch weitere Migranten. Insgesamt können wir von 1850 bis 1934 ziemlich genau sagen, dass 5,8 Millionen Menschen über den Hamburger Hafen ausgewandert sind. Was natürlich ein enormer Wirtschaftsfaktor war. Also nicht nur für die Räder selbst, sondern auch natürlich für den Hamburger Hafen und seine Entwicklung, seine wirtschaftliche Entwicklung, die wir heute kennen, wäre ohne die Auswanderung nicht möglich gewesen. Und deswegen sind natürlich auch die jüdischen Migranten seinerzeit ganz, ganz wichtig gewesen für die Entwicklung des Hamburger Hafens. So we need to understand that um, anti-Semitism is a poison for all society and especially for our democracy. We also need to um, acknowledge that we have a big number of people from civil society, from institutions, sports clubs, uh, political parties, youth organizations that do not hesitate. If something happens here in the city, we see a wave of solidarity with the victims of anti-Semitic crimes and attacks. So this generally makes me very optimistic regarding the fight or combating anti-Semitism in the city and the state of Hamburg. So we do have a few outstanding uh, projects, initiatives, organizations in Hamburg. It's always complicated to highlight or, as we say, uh, use them as a lighthouse that shines and you know, makes everyone see. Um, but we do have a lot of activities I would like to mention um, a few sports institutions who have exchanged programs, especially the bigger uh, sports uh, clubs in Hamburg with Israeli partners. So they would take a youth group, like let's say a, a soccer team or a volleyball team to Israel, have a competition, and then suddenly these kids are together with Israeli youth. This is something that I would like to see to develop in the future and also to expand. We also have fantastic teachers that many of them use their free time um, their creativity and a lot of their own resources to initiate use exchange programs, um, facilitate remembrance initiatives such as, as we call Stolperstein, 
the remembrance projects with the little stones that remember each individual Jewish person before or during the war. And we do also have a lot of activities um, regarding Israeli-German cooperation in the, in the field of science, but also we had a huge number of about 100 people as a delegation from the economic and the educational uh, field uh, three years ago going to Israel to learn and to see and initiate uh, cooperations. I think this is wonderful and this is something that I would like to see to develop more. But I would also like to see a special fund set up by the city of Hamburg to support these initiatives, especially youth projects and school exchanges. Because as I mentioned earlier, many of the teachers who get involved, they need a lot of time and a lot of free time to fund these kind of activities. Centropa's vision is to portray Jewish history of the 20th century by telling these family stories and by focusing on how Jews lived through the entire 20th century, not just how their family members were murdered during the Shoah. This means that when we talk about education, that Centropa's goal is to bring films, exhibitions, biographies, photographs to students and teachers that show young people in the 21st century how Jews were part of uh, the society. We, of course, indirectly also combat anti-Semitic stereotypes, but uh, really we, we want to bring the importance of everyday stories, of Alltagsgeschichten, as we say in German, back to the forefront of education. So it's not about only facts and figures and numbers, but it's about personal stories because we know from experience that this is what touches people and, and how they actually retain information rather than just uh, learning numbers by heart.